It's my distinct pleasure this morning to reintroduce Dr. Hal Huggins, who's probably considered one of the fathers of biological dentistry, along with many of our other speakers, because this is the 25th anniversary of the IBDM, which was the American Academy of Biological Dentistry before. And Hal is the world's most controversial dentist because of his stand on trying to convince dentistry to stop the use of mercury in fillings. He has been in practice for <coughs> A few years, he received a postdoctorate master's at the University of Colorado with emphasis on immunology and toxicity in 1990. He successfully pioneered treatments for autoimmune diseases caused by dental toxins and has personally treated over 5,000 toxic patients. He has lectured worldwide over 2,500 days in 46 of the 50 United States, 14 foreign countries. He has authored several books, written over 50 articles, and given over 1,000 radio, TV article, um, interviews. And as he said earlier, that he is tall, dark, and handsome. I forgot to include that before. And that he has face for radio. <laughs> including 50, <laughs> including uh, shows of, uh, or was that me? Okay. okay. <laughs> He's done 60 Minutes in Australia in 1989 and did 60 Minutes in New Zealand in 2007. My question is, why didn't that come in the United States? Uh, he is currently a consultant worldwide for multidiscipline centers and the founder of the Multidiscipline Alliance for Professionals who practice the Huggins Protocol for Recovery of Autoimmune Diseases. It's my distinct pleasure to reintroduce Dr. Hal Huggins. Face for radio. <clears throat> yeah, thanks. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> One thing you left out there may or may not be of interest. There are a couple of things I think are kind of interesting. Um, over the past um, three and a half years, I have written 19 books. That's from 4.30 in the morning till 7 o'clock in the morning. And that's an interesting experience to go through. Um, <clears throat> the Dental Association, no matter what you have, says that you don't have enough. But in um, the blood chemistry field now, we have over 300,000 blood chemistry data points but I think 300,001 is what's required. Yeah. <clears throat> and we are not quite that far up on the DNA. I've only been doing DNA for four years. We do have several thousand um, bacterial identifications on uh, now over 600 samples. And uh, we did do these in a laboratory that was on a, a campus that uh, had a microbiology lab and I didn't realize it but it also had a dental school. Uh, that led to another change in my life because I had 60 samples which is like 60 patients that suddenly for some unknown reason uh, were destroyed and the head of the laboratory uh, quick retired and left town and uh, the technicians who were our friends would not talk to us. That kind of torqued me a bit to the point that I spent the last dime I had putting together the DNA laboratory and out of that insult and anger came tests that uh, I didn't know we needed. Has anybody ever heard of leprosy? You have? <laughs> I could take that a step further. Um, isn't that a disease that uh, went out 2,000 years ago? How many people have Patients who have leprosy. Anybody? One? 
We have one. Okay. All of you in dentistry have patients who have leprosy if they have root canals because we have found leprosy, the bacterium there, in 20% of the root canals. And yours was one of them, right? Mm -hmm. Patient in good health? <laughs> not exactly. <laughs> yeah. So these are things I was not getting out of the commercial enterprise from the university. But um, they did give a presentation to the dental association showing the causes of gum disease, or at least what they thought was the cause of gum disease. And uh, they said, by the way, we're having all of these. There's some dentist who's sending in all kinds of funny things. Uh, where would you find Klebsiella? Where would you find leprosy? Where would you find, huh? The dental school had no idea, but a few days later, our samples were destroyed. So, <clears throat> you never know what life is going to do with you. It has its own deck of cards, and there are not 52 cards in that deck. But some of the things that have been dealt to me that I didn't like have been the things that have taught me the most. So keep in mind that the things you run into here may take, teach you things you didn't know you wanted to learn. That's very typical. It's very common that somebody who has a question sits in the last row <laughs> and thinks that I can hear. <laughs> if this is something about what we're talking about. I just took a pill. <laughs> I have a pill and they're probably going to want to know which one. <laughs> oh, the little one. <laughs> yeah. Did I get rid of the MS? Not really. I just got uh, three days ahead of it. And now, being 35 years, 40 years older, I'm about a day and a half ahead of it. Because there is a series of combinations. You're not supposed to say anything commercial here, so the name of it is, <clears throat> and <laughs> if I miss that two days, I'm back in a wheelchair. So, yeah, I am not cured, but you didn't know I didn't have the use of my left leg, did you? I mean, I'm walking around here like a semi-human being. But there are other things, the double vision, all these funny things that go along with MS. Um, as it turned out, the primary thing in any of these autoimmune diseases is balancing out the mineral metabolism. And I just met this man in Pennsylvania a few days ago where all the corn genetically modified was four feet one inch high for miles and miles, as far as you could see, except his was not four foot one inch. It was 22 feet high. There's a picture that I had sent to Jamie. Did that come through? Where his wife is reaching up beside one of the corn stalks and doesn't come close to the first ear. So he balances the minerals in the soil. I balance the minerals in the body. And in all of the neurological autoimmune diseases, the primary imbalance is manganese. And so I happen to take manganese, and in six minutes, hey, that leg worked. It got my attention. It also got my attention an hour later when <laughs> it went out again. And so I got along pretty well for a while and then crashed again. And that's what taught me that chromium and manganese are on a teeter-totter. And if you take manganese without the chromium, you depress the chromium, and pretty soon you end up with the same problem for the opposite reason. 
And so being scientifically oriented, I started taking chromium. And everything got well until I got an excess of chromium and a deficiency of manganese. I had the MS back again. So ma manganese, as it turns out, is the number one deficiency in all of the autoimmune diseases that I have seen. Now, I haven't seen all of them because I think there are 200 of them. But yes, it is very important that you have manganese in balance with chromium, in balance with zinc, in balance <coughs> with magnesium, with a twist of potassium. And if you can keep that balance, which took eight years to figure out how to keep it from getting each thing out of balance, then you have a cell membrane that knows how to take in the nutrient and get rid of the waste products. But when you start taking these one at a time, you're creating all kinds of creatures here within your body chemistry that is not running in balance. And that's the advantage of the blood chemistry to me. The blood chemistry shows where I should be because we do not use the normal ranges. That's 90, by definition, 95.56% of the population. But you find that the highs come down, the lows come up when you get rid of the dental interferences and get people on an ancestral diet. Then it comes sometimes to a point which I call the stability point, and sometimes to the stability range. Now, what I was going to say doesn't sound right. <clears throat> I, was, I, I was going to say there's no difference between males and females. Um, there, are, <laughs> there are people who will argue that. I probably could too. <clears throat> but in, for instance, in the red cell count, hemoglobin, hematocrit, red cells. There is a male range and there is a female range, probably because the females do this thing that males don't every month, and so that means they're weird. Uh, of course, young girls and old women don't do that, and they still are stuck with this range. That didn't make sense to me. But I did find that in the absence of the toxic dental materials, the male's high ranges come down. The female's low red cell ranges come up. And if you follow them for a few months, you find they become narrower until they become a point. So there is no difference between males and females as far as red cells are concerned. It's just the reaction of the male is to increase and the reaction in the female is to decrease. We have different reactions, but the stability point is the same and it is a point. So it makes it very easy to see if you are doing what you're supposed to in diagnosis and if the patient is doing what they are supposed to. If the treatment and the compliance is where it should be, then you've got a very narrow target. And it doesn't move from day to day. As political and financial interests come into medicine, <clears throat> ranges move. And the range of cholesterol, when I first started into this, was 150 to 330, and it has come down and down. Well, if we treat people with high cholesterols and low cholesterols, the highs come down, the lows come up, and there is a point, and that point is 222 milligrams percent. <clears throat> that was taught to me by Melvin Page in 1968. Today, the perfect level for cholesterol is 222. It has not moved. Truth does not change. Cholesterol is one of the most important things in the body. It is the second most important to me. It's the only thing that will knock out Clostridium perfringens, gas gangrene. Oh, gas gangrene. I heard about that in school one time. <clears throat> yeah, well, we hear about it every week in the laboratory because, yes, these things do appear in root canals. 
botulism appears in root canals. As far as I'm concerned, multiple sclerosis is complex. And botulism and its close relatives are part of it. There are 150 different clostridia. You take this much botulism, that would kill all the people on the planet, wouldn't it? Probably so. Thimbleful would knock out New York. <clears throat> and this is what people are carrying around in their root canals. And somebody was asking me during the break here, well, how would you convince somebody to have that taken out of their mouth? I don't care. Because this treatment is not for everybody. It's only for those who are interested in their health. And if you're interested in your health, you don't want a condominium for clostridium living in your mouth. <laughs> Write that one down. That was kind of cute. <laughs> But if you look at the symptoms of ALS and the symptoms of multiple sclerosis, even though they're very different diseases, there are different clostridia that produce similar symptoms. So is there a cousin in here? Is there a metal? Is mercury? Is copper? Is aluminum? Is something stimulating that to produce the symptoms that we categorize as MS? So yeah. The manganese, when I took that, I thought I was cured. Well, there is no cure, but that was the step. That was the attention getter. That manganese is part of, oh, chromium is part of, with manganese, uh, zinc has to be oh, with magnesium. It's complex. But when you pull it together, when your chemistry is in balance, you know it and the patient knows it. You have something positive to see. You have numbers that do not move as committees are paid to change levels, like just dropping the level of cholesterol 10 points, which I think was done in 2005 by a committee on cholesterol education, of which the 14 members admitted to payoffs from the statin manufacturers. Dr. Pasternak, the head of the committee, got payoffs from nine companies. Do you think the rest of the people in the committee were jealous? No, they got payoffs from 14 companies. Uh, if somebody is going to pay, I mean, everybody has a price, right? If you come up with the right answer, we might ask you next year to do the same thing, to get one of these little white envelopes. But the next year, after lowering the standard by 10 points on cholesterol, Pfizer alone made 32 billion more than they had the year before. So that's why the levels are coming down. Because what's the most important thing in the world? Some people in here know it. What is it? Money. In America. Hmm? In America. In America. In America. Not in the jungle. Oh, not in the jungle. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> where is it not the most important? Okay, in the jungle. That's probably true. A knife would be more important in the jungle. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the ability to yell loud, you know, like Tarzan. Or Okay, <clears throat> how are you going to protect yourself? A negative ion generator takes out the mercury vapor and the particulate mercury and bacteria, a lot of things it's going to pull out of the air. What about wearing a mask? Well, I built a little instrument one time to measure what a mask does. Your surgical mask? What does it do? It blocks out the mercury vapor for up to 23 seconds. Well, then I did another test. I had a mercury vapor analyzer. So 
I was noticing on myself when I wore a mask, I felt funny after removing amalgam <clears throat> because I'd had my amalgams removed my immune system was trying to heal. So I took this thing and came in behind the mask and then I would measure the, the mercury vapor out here. 400% higher behind the mask right here by my nose than it was in front of the mask. Now, how do you explain that? Well, I have a friend who's a toxicologist and he explained that a lot of what's coming up is particulate mercury. It is very small fragments of amalgam and they hit the mask and then <sighs> You breathe your hot breath into that mask and you release the mercury from the particulate mercury and then all that vapor comes in and that's why you have a higher concentration of mercury vapor behind the mask than you do in front of the mask out here where stuff is coming up. <clears throat> so we developed the bubble operatory, the dental dome it is called. And or a circular thing so there's no place for mercury to catch in a corner and all in a Faraday cage, all kinds of safe thing. It was the only safe dental operatory in the world. The state attorney general made me destroy it because it implied that mercury was hazardous. <laughs> but the things that went on in that were kind of amazing. <clears throat> But in there, I looked like I was going to try for 20,000 leagues under the sea because I had a mask with canisters. So, yes, if you're going to protect yourself and your assistant, then you wear the canister type of face mask. And you can have your prescription for your glasses put into this so you can see what you're doing here. And then, of course, we had the mercury... Uh, well, we had negative ion generators in there, um, but we had the um, mercury vapor detector to see what all was going on in the atmosphere. And after cutting, after finishing cutting in that with a laminar airflow and everything else, we could bring the level down to zero within three to five seconds of finishing cutting out amalgam. But before that, the amount of mercury vapor in the air is quite high enough to um, allow you to be eligible for a $10,000 fine from EPA, OSHA, whoever the people are who come in and say your mercury level is too high. We have a question back here in the, in the back row. Right. The methyl mercury is 100 times more neurotoxic than any of the other two forms. There are basically three forms of mercury. There are more than that, but one of them only lasts about a microsecond. Um, but methyl mercury is fat soluble, it goes through membranes as if they weren't there. There is no placental barrier, there's no blood-brain barrier because both are rich in fat in their cell membranes and methylmercury walks through it like it wasn't there. Then it's kind of strange what happens because the methylmercury has high transportation visas, can go anywhere. But what it does when it stops it rips off its shirt and there's a big S on its chest, you know, like it's just turned into Superman. And then it is in the ionic form, HG++. HG++ can kill anything within arm's reach. That's very dangerous. Then it converts back into methylmercury steps through the lipid membranes and goes into another cell, rips off its costume, 
becomes HG++, the ionic form, and kills everything within arm's reach there. So the real problem with methylmercury is its high transportation abilities. Now, mercury vapor, as it comes off of a filling, has a predisposition for getting into the brain. And how far is it from the filling <sighs> into the sinuses, up into the brain? We're talking about a very short trip. And it specializes in disturbing things going on in the brain, like eyesight. Um, I get a little disturbed when people beat up kids who are defenseless. And I see this in airports where I go in and there's a kid about this big running around with trifocals. I know he's got two comb crowns and some amalgam in his mouth because the mercury vapor goes up, goes right into the eye. I have asked large audiences sometimes where you can't really say, look what he said, look what she did. Um, how many people remember when you had your first amalgam placed? Okay, some people remember. How many people can remember when you first started wearing glasses? How many people have those two dates within six months of each other? Okay, nearsightedness in particular is a dental disease. And we can see that in the retina of the eye. You can see around the optic disc the black area that occurs. Ophthalmologists are not taught that this is mercury, but I figured out that that was mercury, and the ophthalmologists, the medical ones, have all agreed that, yeah, that's it, because we have taken people who are close to blind, start getting the mercury out of the body, and those things do get smaller, and the vision comes back. We've given vision back to several people. That's kind of fun, and it's non-taxable. That's neat to do. But it didn't have to happen. If you didn't put it in in the first place, it wouldn't have happened. Okay, high ventilation capacity. This is something else that's going to upset some people, like it upset me. Um <clears throat> But I asked the toxicologist about, uh, you know, suction, big suction things to pull the mercury vapor out. And he just looked at me and grinned. I said, what does that mean? If we took a group like this, you're all sitting there, and I take a fan and I put it over here and turn it on, what's that going to do to you? Where is it going to move you to? No place. You can stay right where you are. And as he explained it, mercury is very heavy. I mean, its atomic weight is 200.8 or something in the vicinity of 200. That's heavy. So when you have a big suction going on, the air moves and the mercury atoms say to each other, man, somebody must have turned on a fan. <laughs> and they just sit there. Because they don't go with the flow. They don't move with the, with the air. The only thing that reduces the amount of mercury vapor is water. So when you are cutting out an old amalgam, you want the assistant there with water and drown that tooth while you're cutting. You know, stop once in a while so you see if you're still in the amalgam. <coughs> Cut this out. And that will reduce the mercury vapor, reduction in temperature. But the air, everybody feels like you're doing a lot of good, so I don't criticize using that. But is it really getting rid of mercury vapor in the air? No, it really isn't. It probably gets rid of some bacteria, and you know, it's a good thing to do. Uh, but don't get fooled into thinking that that is reducing the mercury level. Yes, negative ion generators will reduce the mercury level down to about zero. How long do you suggest running the negative ion generator after the procedure? 
Well, <coughs> we usually turn them off once a month to clean the points. So you just turn it on and leave it on. Yeah, there is, because most dental offices have been dental offices for a long time. It's in the ceiling, it's in the floor, it's in the walls, and when you walk out, it seeps in through there, and weekends are a good time to just clean that up a little bit more. Okay, about two more questions, and then... The Huggins negative ion. <laughs> no, that's that's not the name of it, but we do have them manufactured because there are a lot of different things that go on with negative ion generators. Oh, that's mercury vapor. Yeah, that's coming up, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't stay up very long. It's going to start filtering down into the carpet, into the floor, or something. But yeah, uh, it is coming off of there. And if it's in the filling, of course, it's going up into the nasal cavities, from there into the lungs, where it methylates within 15 seconds and attaches to the red blood cells and then your methylmercury can travel any place it wants through the body. Okay, one more. It's going to help, but uh, what I was saying is don't get fooled into thinking that's going to reduce your mercury vapor down to zero because it'll reduce it some, but uh, not a terribly significant amount according to the toxicologist. Yeah. Can I answer that question? Yes. However, I think we better wait if I'm going to get through the rest of this. So hang on to that question and uh, I will address it provided we got, we're going to have time here. Okay, then there is detoxification. And keep in mind this is a very important statement. Detoxification is retoxification. That's courtesy of Tom Levy, and I have quoted that a bunch of times. Why is that? Because detoxification, as it is really meant, is easy. Releasing mercury, yeah, there are a lot of things can do that. So let's take a little bit of this and more of that and a lot of this. and You can release a whole lot of mercury, but does excretion change? No. There's only a certain amount that can be excreted. And if you exceed the excretion abilities with detoxification, you are creating retoxification, redistribution, just because you take mercury out of the bone in the arm and planted in the brain does not mean you have healed the patient. So this is very delicate and it is shown to you in a very inexpensive way in looking at a CBC, the red blood cells and white cells. Um, I remember <coughs> we talk about the effects on the brain of the dentist by exposures to mercury. I was talking to a group of dentists one time, and I said, you know, dentistry is under, or the immune system is under the absolute control of dentistry. 
You control every patient's immune system. The least you could do is do a CBC. And this one guy said, yeah, uh, how do you spell that? <laughs> the more exposure to mercury we get, hey, I remember the things that I did 20, 30, 40 years ago. I'm embarrassed about now, but I sure believed in what I was saying at that, at that, at that, at that, 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 that time. Yeah. Okay. The CBC is your red cells and white blood cells, and they are very sensitive to the presence of mercury. So if you are exceeding excretion with your detoxification, you're going to see changes in the CBC. You're going to see an increase in the total white cells. You're going to see a depression of the lymphocytes as they become overloaded. You're going to see an increase in the PMNs. You're going to see monocytes getting in there trying to relieve things which they may not be able to do if you wore braces because the monocyte, one of the detoxifying parts of the uh, immune system is under the control of the orthodontist. If you wore braces, I can tell that looking at your CBC up to 32 years after the braces were removed because the body knows it needs to spend a lot of time getting rid of nickel because nickel is carcinogenic. And that's what you've been putting in people. In fact, I'm giving a lecture <clears throat> two on uh, breast cancer next week. And again, we start with dentistry. You start out with putting chrome crowns in kids at two, three, four, five years old. Ten years later, there's another nickel exposure with braces. Ten, twenty years later, you break off a cusp and you get a nickel crown placed and probably a root canal to go with it. And getting back to the meridians, if that is on one of the bicuspids, you're in the crosshairs for breast cancer. Because working backwards, those women who have had, and men, 10% are men, who have breast cancer have root canals on the bicuspid meridians. Now, I challenge that to start with, and when I found about 19 out of 20 were on the bicuspids, well, you know, there might be something to this. <clears throat> then there was a fellow from Joseph Issels from Germany called me when I first got into root canals, and he said, it is not just the breast cancer. It is all the cancers. We have treated this for uh, 40 years, and we find that every case of cancer up to 97% have root canal in their mouth or have had root canal. So before I treat the patient, we have the dentist get rid of all the root canal. You take care of the root canals, then I can take care of terminal cancer. If you leave root canal in, I no can do. Well, that was my introduction to root canals and cancer. And cancer is a very dangerous place to play because you get that little red spot on your forehead just before everything goes black when they pull the trigger. It is the biggest industry in the United States. And what's the most important thing in the United States? Money. So if you mess with them, there's a price to pay. You need to be informed, then you can make an informed choice, which is more than we give our patients, because we tell them, hey, a root canal is the way to go. We don't need to take out a perfectly good dead tooth. Yeah. So. You think you know what the next slide is? Oh. 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 <laughs> okay, this is old information. No, it's this week. I was thinking it was last week. Yeah. Now, Don, this is why I wanted to be able to come up with a new um, 
whatever you call those little things that go round and round and reflect in the sunlight. Yeah. CVDBVD. Sounds. No complaints. You're doing all right. Is that right? Okay, I can keep going. All right, this is relatively new, new information because for some reason or other, in many industries, they have a department called planned obsolescence. Your cars are going to last so long, and then when you get the speedometer goes that next mile, all the wheels are going to fall off, the pistons are going to quit working, the carburetor, they don't have carburetors anyway. Anyway. There's planned obsolescence, and in dentistry, we want to put something in that lasts a lifetime. And what we're doing is having things last a lifetime by shortening the lifetime. <laughs> <clears throat> and aluminum is a whole lot more toxic than I thought it was. Now, Boyd mentioned toxicity. Yeah, there is a certain amount of toxicity to aluminum. It does damage. At one time, they thought that uh, Alzheimer's came from aluminum. It's a supporting actor there, <clears throat> but its real action is in what it does to the bacteria. Here is the control. This is the pure strain of, uh, of toxin. Now, if we take the aluminum concentration at 10%, 1%, a hundredth of a percent, a thousandth of a percent, by the time we get up to 10 to the minus sixth, we got one part per um, million. Uh, nothing's happening yet because the aluminum is killing the bacteria. Now, when it gets down to a certain point, it quits killing the bacteria but starts forming the toxin. So here, getting out here, there's a little light. This is brightening up. At one part per billion, aluminum starts forming the toxin. And this is the toxin that is found in breast cancer. Is that correct? Hefnia, yeah. Okay. So going up. 10, 11, 12, we're up here now at one part per trillion. We are still manufacturing the toxin that creates one of them that creates is one of them that is found in conjunction with breast cancer. Is that politically correct? 13, 14, we're up to one part per hundred trillion. And finally, at one part per quadrillion, it disappears. How much does it take to create that? Tune in next week. It's in the incubator as we speak. But where do we get aluminum? Where do we get aluminum? We get this from porcelain crowns. Porcelain is supposed to be safe. Porcelain is not. When that test was originally developed at the University of Colorado, we could determine that aluminum was coming out of ceramic in amounts that were significant. And <clears throat> not all people agree with that, but I think this blows it out of the saddle. Certainly, it uh, blows me out of the saddle at thinking that aluminum was dangerous up in this area where it was uh, still killing tissues but this is a lot more dangerous. And the composites that last the best, you know, we want things to last a lifetime. The composites that last the longest have the highest amount of aluminum. They also happen to be number one in sales. So yes, we are putting in you know, so many people say, yeah, I went to a biological dentist and had the amalgam yanked in and something white put in. Most of the something white that goes in is very high in aluminum. So it is creating, uh, this is just one of the toxins. Hafnia produces, what, four toxins or three? Huh? Three? So this is just one of the three toxins that just one bacteria is producing. Now, this is 
not a test that's done in 10 minutes. There's a lot of work that goes into coming up with a result like that. But when we're talking about one part in a hundred trillion still being able to form toxins, we're talking about something that is very powerful, very dangerous, and very common in dentistry. We have been taking out porcelain crowns for more than 10 years, I don't know, 20 years maybe, and turning around the incurable diseases. In most cases, except for ALS, a lot more times do we win than lose. Um, but is there justification for that? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the justification right there. And this is just one of the 92 bacteria or microbes that we are studying at this time. At some point in time, we may study more if uh, Tweak has his way about it. <laughs> we did have a couple of questions, I presume, are on this. What are you replacing the aluminum with? A composite that does not have aluminum in it. If you, you can get, not necessarily from the MSDS, but uh, pig drills, um, some of the implants have a fair amount of aluminum in them, three and a half to five percent, which is quite adequate to dissolve the bone that they're inserted into. That's not real safe. But there are, I'm guessing, 40 percent of the composites that do not have aluminum in them. And getting the biocompatibility test done, I have to qualify this with a laboratory that considers aluminum as toxic, as dangerous. You do not want to use the composites that have aluminum. Now there's various reactions to aluminum and I will discuss those in just a moment. But we do use for the um, aesthetics, we will use a gold base and um, uh, one of the laboratory process composites on top of it that does not have aluminum in it. Have you tested resins? I think that's what composites are. Uh, composite resins are what we're talking about here. Yeah. yeah. So it's all one and the same thing. Two words describing the same material. Uh-huh. We're in progress. We've got yeah. some cooking right now. Wait, wait till you check the resins. What? Wait till you find out about the resins, what they do. I want to wait two slides. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to have to go back to ivory. Ivory teeth. Okay, if that's what you want to do, you can go back to ivory teeth. <laughs> no, there is uh, about two slides down the down the line. We'll have... Go ahead. Uh, I didn't understand the last slide about the gas connection. Uh, if you take a tumor and, and, and put it in the face and have a, like a bug going up. If you take the tumor and put it in solution for breast cancer to find out what the bugs were, how did you know what bugs that breast cancer had? Uh, that is in the scientific literature. That has been tested in the conventional uh, petri dish and microscope. Yeah, those have been found that way. What we're looking for is the DNA that's within those. We could do it out of breast tissue, but what I'm doing is looking for the origins of where that is, but there's, I don't know whether it's hundreds or thousands, but there are a lot of articles in the literature. It's a new, relatively new concept that uh, you see articles, is cancer a bacterial infection? And there's certainly a lot of people in the medical profession who uh, subscribe to that. And when you find the bacteria in the tumor, which they have plated out, and we find the same bacteria in the root canal tooth, then there is a possibility there's a connection between the two. And one thing we've noted, there are people who are getting diseases in organs that uh, uh, I don't see how that happened. 
uh, it started with vaginal infections in women who should not really have vaginal infections. But I was finding all these bugs in the root canals and cavitations and bone implants. And when you've got that in the mouth, when you've got the bone graft, when you've got the root canal or whatever, the bacteria don't stay. Uh, they've got an incubator, the tooth, but then they get out into the periodontal ligament, into the surrounding bone, and every time you bite down, it goes into the circulatory system. And from the circulatory system, there's this thing called chemotaxis. That is an affinity to some tissue in the body. And so these bacteria got to wandering around, and they found something that looked like the... Uh, vaginal condominium and moved in. Uh, this is my personal opinion. I haven't found this in the literature. But that's where those infections, I felt, had a reasonable origin. And then you start looking at other tissues. And where does it come first? Where do you pick these things up? A lot of these bacteria are in the soil. So you find gardening in particular will get a lot of this stuff through inhalation into the bloodstream. And one of the sumps in the head is the lower third molar cavitation. In particular, if you've had your tonsils removed, that's a long, very short way to say something that's a long explanation. <clears throat> but just remember those terms because they will come up at some point in the future. And then through chemotaxis, we're going to be distributing that throughout the body. So they do come from external causes, and in particular, these sexually transmitted diseases are not always sexually transmitted. They can come from other sources. And when they hit the bloodstream, they can end up in those areas. And they're not sexually transmitted. So some people are being falsely accused of things that they really haven't done. Um, all right, the control on what we just saw, the one on aluminum, the control was in a broth that is conducive to toxin formation. Um, Jamie, can you go back one slide so I can point that out, that this is the control. So what we have here is the pure strain of toxin from this particular bacteria that was up here. Okay. Uh, at one part per 10 billion, we start producing toxins and stop killing the bacteria. Now what's happening here is we're getting, uh, as the concentration goes down, then we're going to have more toxin formation, less killing of the bugs. Uh, and as you have less bacteria, there would be a greater concentration of the metal. Even though it's low levels, percentage-wise, it's a greater concentration. Now this was, I don't know, I get excited about some weird things, but I found this rather interesting. Aluminum at 1 times 10 to the 8th, minus 8, that is, isn't it? That should be uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 8. It's a very small concentration. Unwinds the DNA. You know, the DNA is a dual spiral helix. Well, if you unwind that, where you have to have copper on one end and zinc on the other, and then you unwind it with aluminum, then the bacteria <coughs> can start making the toxin because the DNA has to be unwound before it can produce a toxin. And that's why we have not seen a lot of these toxins. We didn't see them 50 years ago because we did not have this situation to create the modern diseases. Then the metal can get inside and target the plasmid. The plasmid is the area that actually manufactures the toxin. And these plasmids can be shared from one bacteria to another. The first time I ever heard of a plasmid was uh, in the 1980s when I was taking my postdoc. And the uh, professors were rather excited about the discovery there was such a thing as a plasmid. And I thought, hey, this answers a lot of our questions. <laughs> 30 years later, I found out through Tweak 
that, uh, yeah, it is answering a lot of our questions. So this is why we are unwinding the DNA so that the aluminum and other metals, copper, mercury, etc., can get in and stimulate the formation of toxins that were heretofore unknown. <clears throat> yeah, the composites with aluminum may last longer, but does the patient. This is what the patient needs to be informed of. But this puts a different perspective on aluminum containing porcelains and high aluminum composites, as well as aluminum cookware, things like, like corning ware. There are a lot of... Um, a can of beer made in an aluminum can. You think that doesn't change chemistries? Yeah, we found that out back in the 70s that uh, soft drinks and beer in aluminum cans will significantly change the chemistry. Um, Jeff Coors is a friend of mine, and I have been trying to convince him. Coors was the first company to come out with the aluminum can. Uh, Bill Coors went to Europe and spent almost a year learning how to work with aluminum. So they start out with an ingot that's about this big, and they put it in a machine and hit it with a bazillion tons of pressure, and <laughs> you end up with an aluminum can from it. But there's a lot of aluminum exposed to the food, to the beverage that's in there. And you do pick up the aluminum from that. So dentistry is not the only source of aluminum. It's just the only source that's 24-7. <clears throat> now, if we look at immune reactivity against dental materials, um, there, when you're doing the optical density scanning to find out if there is aluminum, if there is immune reactivity to the dental materials, uh, the scale is not really 1 to 100, it's, uh, it's more of a 1 to 2,500 sensitivity with the optical density scanner. Looks through the serum to find out if there has been an increase in antibody antigen complexing in there. So the scale turns out to be more like uh, converting it down, dividing by... Um, a hundred to make it a little more, a little easier to to say grace over a scale of one to a hundred is a lot easier than a scale of one to two thousand five hundred, and on one to two thousand five hundred, a move of five or ten points is totally insignificant. But what this is measuring is the antibody antigen complexing, and if you have an antigen that's this big and um, antibody the same size and you hook them together, it's twice as big as it used to be. It does not go through the kidney very well and so it stops up in the kidney creating glomerular nephritis which is an autoimmune disease in the kidney. And this can happen with people who have been given IV glutathione. Glutathione is a wonderful thing at the right dosage. But I have done a lot of testing on glutathione. I find that there is a lot of variation in the amount of glutathione that people require. Now, at my weight, which is now down to 190, <clears throat> um, 60 milligrams does me very well, as long as I don't take it every day. Once or twice a week, yeah, does a real good job. But some of the glutathiones are 500 or more milligrams. Re detoxification is retoxification. Your body cannot get rid of that much. The glutathione can bind to it, but it's going to get hung up in the kidney and create a high creatinine you will see in the blood test and an autoimmune disease of the kidney. So looking at aluminum, here are just two clients. I picked at random. This is on that scale that would be more like 1 to 150. Um, 
you get aluminum, get any of these metals above 20 or 25, they're significant. Well, here are two clients picked at random, 109, 122, copper, 99 and 122, gold, 3 and 2. Hey, that's pretty close to insignificant. So gold seems to get along pretty well with the immune system. Now, acrylamide, that's the resin that I told you to wait two slides for. This is the slide. I can hardly wait. <laughs> it's right here. It's up on us now. <laughs> okay, the acrylamides, um, polymethyl methraculate and so on, seven and four. So that's pretty low. And we find this with most of the resins, the plastics, they're not as bad as we thought. Now, to color them, if you want to take a denture and make it look pink, what do you add? Mercury, cadmium. Those are the two pink coloring agents that are added to give you the pink color. Now, you got a problem. And that's why we use clear acrylic. With a denture right across the first buy to first buy, okay, I recommend putting in a little pink acrylic there because this is, what, a hundredth of one percent of the total amount of a whole denture? That may be high, but you know more than half the patients won't accept that. They want a totally clear acrylic. And if they're young and you know the lip line's a little bit higher, you see they're teeth floating in the air and it looks a little weird. So I do prefer putting, I'll go for a little bit of, of uh, mercury up there for coloring. Acrylamide, the same as Metacrylate? Yeah, they're basically all acrylics. All acrylics have pretty much the same formula to them. So we don't have much reaction there. Barium, there's not a whole lot of reaction to that, but if somebody had a barium enema 20 years ago, I can identify it today in hair analysis. They use barium because it's not absorbed. If it's not absorbed, and they stick it in, you know, down here, how come I'm finding it up here if it's not absorbed? Yeah, but it takes a long time to get rid of that. Platinum, four and five, yeah, that is, um, Pretty low reactivity. Now, in uh, the test of 100 clients looking at their optical density scanning, of those that are in the toxic range, 100% were of 100 people were sensitive to mercury, 100% to aluminum, 100% to copper, only 95% to nickel, and what people keep telling me is so safe, zirconium. 89%, let it speak for itself. How about titanium? You don't want, titanium? you don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't recall the number on titanium, but there are 80 some that have been tested here. I just picked the ones I was gonna be t talking on because I will be talking on titanium at the first of the year when we start talking about what we found with implants. I'm not sure I can answer that, but I do remember a fellow coming in one time trying to sell me a porcelain, and I said, no, we don't use aluminum. He says, oh, but you don't understand. This is a non-metallic aluminum. <laughs> I said, you're right. I don't understand. <clears throat> but I don't understand how it's aluminum oxide, like zirconium oxide. What is the difference chemically? Because they do dissociate. They are not supposed to dissociate, but if they didn't dissociate, we wouldn't see the results that we're seeing here. So they do dissociate. What about palladium? Palladium? Palladium. palladium. Yeah, palladium, I was gonna say highly toxic. Well, it is not as bad as mercury, but I remember maybe 10 years ago, they interrupted national television in Germany 
to say if you're going to a dentist to have a crown place that has palladium in it, don't accept it. And if you are a dentist, do not ever order palladium again. Now, in the studies we did at the University of Colorado, which was some time back, I do happen to remember the palladium figure uh, was 35% are immune reactive, which means antigen, antibody, complexing, getting a large molecule that hangs up in the kidney. So at least 35% of the people, I mean 35% of the people is a fair number of people, but it is not as bad as a lot of the dental materials but it's still something your patient may not want to take a chance with. Eliza, it's a animal. I didn't. I mean, this is what we found. I mean, we did, we've done, well, I had the laboratory for about 10 years and then sold it out to Tom Levy a long time ago. Um, but at the University of Colorado, this was under very strict scrutiny because uh, they were quite concerned that the Dental Association was going to come do something bad to the university. So everything that was done there, we had at least three professors checking every step that was done. And as far as immune reactivity, the ELISA test is not the same. I don't remember exactly what it is. They're both immunologic tests. But here, these are precipitin tests studied with optical density scanning in the serum where you can detect the limits, as I mentioned, of one to 2,500. That's pretty accurate. That's not as accurate as what we're doing with the DNA. The DNA testing is accurate to four times 10 to the, to the what? 30th. To the 32nd power, to the 30th. 30th. 30th is yeah, S16, no, X16 times two would be 32. One percent, no, one percent. Well, that's. It's like finding one grain of sand on a planet. On a what? On the planet. Finding one grain of sand on the planet. Is that good enough for you, Tweak? Yeah, it works. It works. <laughs> you see why this drives me nuts? I feel lucky if I found the beach. <laughs> you went to one grain of sand. <clears throat> so the DNA is more accurate, but I will, um, from what I remember, we had a possibility of using the ELISA test and the precipitin reaction. We studied four different types of reactivity to study the dental materials. And the precipitin was something that, that means it precipitates, uh, was reasonably easy to do. You get the serum sample and you put a sample of the material in it and instantly you have a drop of cream in it. I mean, the reaction is far less than one second. And it could be measured with that accuracy. So that's why we elected to go that, that route. I'm not sure how that relates at all to ELISA, but that's the test that we used at University of Colorado. OK. Now, this is probably not a complete list. In fact, I could guarantee it's not a complete list since Tweak has added 10 more bacteria since we did this. I call you that because I love you, okay? And you always hurt the ones you love. And what? Well, you always hurt the ones you love. <laughs> <laughs> no, I am very proud of what you've done here because it has certainly helped a lot of people and expanded my education. Now, um, there was this guy, oh, Weston Price. <clears throat> Weston Price um, found that he could take an extracted root canal tooth, take a little piece of the root tip, stick it under the skin of a rabbit, and in uh, inside of two weeks, 
if the patient had had a heart attack and he took that tube put on in two weeks, the rabbit dies of a heart attack. He would take it out, put it in another rabbit, and in two weeks that rabbit dies of a heart attack. He'd take it out and put it in a third rabbit, and that one would die of a heart attack. And he would conventionally do this for 30 rabbits in a row. Now, uh, to me, I don't see how he could have missed because just in the beginning work that we have done, these are the bacteria, 28 bacteria we find in root canals that have the potential to give a heart attack. Which one? Yeah, about any of them, some more strongly than others. But if you got to find one out of 28 here, it's hard to miss that, yes, any of these can dam will damage the heart to the point of a heart attack may take two or three to do it, but we will conventionally find maybe as many as 10 or 15, in some cases more than that, in one root canal tooth. So if you've got two, three, four root canal teeth, no wonder you've got such a problem with heart disease. Now, we see about the same thing with neurological challenges. It's just different bacteria and different toxins. But this is what we see. These are the 23 bacteria that are found in neurological disease. And I've seen some pretty serious diseases with just three of these present in like a cavitation. Cavitations and root canals, what is the difference? Well, there are more bacteria in cavitations than there are in root canals. But probably they originated in the root canal as the incubator and then migrated into the cavitation. <clears throat> now, with multiple sclerosis, uh, we've got the top five and the top 10 and a lot of diseases. And uh, these are the ones that you're going to find associated most often with MS. Candida albicans, would that be in a yeast form or in the fungal form? probably in the fungal form, 65% of the time. Fusobacterium, which is not a real nice one, 55%. Gamella, Neisseria. Um, <laughs> Peripheromonas gingivalis. Peripheromonas gingivalis. Thank you. 40%. He's not a very nice actor either. This guy does a whole lot of damage more than just to multiple sclerosis. Well, why not give a broad spectrum antibiotic? You know, kill everything around. Isn't that the best way to do it? Well, there are two types of antibiotics. There is the bactericidal and there is the bacteriostatic. The bactericidal, like homicidal, suicidal, to kill. So bactericidals will kill. I have not used antibiotics for the first 48 years of my practice, 47. The last three years we have found that there are advantages to using the bacteriostatics because the bacteriostatic sterilizes the bacteria. What's the advantage? The bactericidal kills and forms the LPS, which is um, endotoxin. And endotoxin is pretty bad. All right, endotoxin, when you get a, um, when you get a bactericidal antibiotic and put it in, it targets the, um, targets the bacteria and this is what happens you get a bactericidal explosion. You don't have one bacteria to kill. You now have a hundred lipopolysaccharides in the toxins sitting here. Each one has to be cleaned up by the immune system. Do you ever hear of somebody getting sick, going to the doctor, getting antibiotics and getting more sicker? This is why because the immune system is overwhelmed 100 to 1 over what it used to be because it has to take care of all of what you see. Yeah. 
Uh, <clears throat> next. So, in answer to these problems, a lot of it lies in advancing to the rear, which means that it's going to be a tough trip from where we are now because we have all been trained. We've all done these things. I've certainly done everything here that I talk about that is bad. Hey, I've done every one of them. I do have one hope. I know that I will meet St. Peter, and I just hope that he has Alzheimer's. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here are some key notes. <laughs> Avoid root canals and people you like. Now, for the head of the, FD, of the FDA or the ADA, if they come to you, let them have the root canals for free. I'll pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> Remove the periodontal ligament with a burr because the periodontal ligament is where everything hatches and goes and concentrates. So you can sterilize a tooth, you sterilize a column of air in the middle of the tooth. You have 75 auxiliary canals. You have three and a half miles of dentin tubules that you're going to sterilize with some kind of a laser that can't go around corners. I don't think so. That's not going to happen. Take the tooth out and test it. You certainly don't find sterility. Avoid aluminum, nickel, copper, and mercury restorations. This is a whole new avenue of looking at dentistry. Avoid the copper in gold crowns because if you have gold and amalgam both in the same mouth, that's going to increase the electrical activity 1,000%, a tenfold increase when you have gold and amalgam both. But 90% of the Commercial golds contain copper because the platinum and palladium turn it silver. You're not going to pay that kind of money for something that looks like a piece of silver. So we put copper in it to make it look like gold. Avoid nickel in crowns, chrome crowns. These kids don't have a choice at age two, three, and four. This is not the time to start their road to cancer. That is not fair. Braces. Some of them now are made with the acrylates and so on. Okay, that's fine. The um, Crozet appliance is made out of gold wire. Hey, this is okay. But the nickel is getting to be nickel. I didn't have time to show the things like on um, aluminum, what aluminum does. But I tell you, nickel is not any better. <coughs> what can you do? You can learn about implants. That information will come out around the first of the year. Learn about bone grafts. I'm not sure I can wait that long on bone grafts. Learn about microbiology. What is the connection between dentistry and disease? Microbiology is the link. Now, I'm not saying you have to learn how to pronounce those things. You just have to learn what they do. And the use of um, the Bacteria statics, we are using very low dosages. Instead of 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams a day, with those that are bacteria static, we may cut those down to 50 milligrams. We may cut them to 25 milligrams. We may use them Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Give the immune system a chance to do its own job and catch up, but do not overwhelm it. There is one of the bacteria here that we are having very good results with, with seven milligrams Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I overwhelm the patients to start with using 25 milligrams when the recommended dosage was 500. So low-dose antibiotics is a new concept that is certainly worth investigating if you're looking into the um, bacteria statics. But there's one other thing that's rather interesting. There are some of the bactericidals that when you get down into the low dosages become bacteriostatic. Now, how do they do that? I don't know. But it is in the literature 
it does work. So we'll be experimenting with that in the future. Go back to butter. Don't touch margarine. If I have a cholesterol of 400 and I want to drop it, I give the patient two eggs a day and a quarter of a pound of butter a day, and I can drop a cholesterol 100 points in six days. Butter, no nutrient is absorbed unless it is in conjunction with fat. And on a low-fat diet, people are going to starve to death. Go back to gardening. Don't have to use all the artificial stuff. Avoid the GMO grains whenever you can. It's getting to be, it's going to be easier next year than it is now. There are some laws coming into effect to say you have to announce on the labeling. Now I get sick and tired of the labeling rules, but here, yeah, it is uh, necessary. Uh, I'm getting some hand signals down here. I'll have to take the questions a little later. <laughs> okay, I guess that's not unusual. All right. Hybrid seeds will grow or popular because they grow in the absence of specific nutrients. If we go back to the original seeds and we fertilize the soil not with nitrates but with minerals, that's when you get the 22-foot stock of corn instead of the 4.1 genetically modified. Go back to incandescent light bulbs. If I'm going to be <laughs> if I'm going to be someplace more than two or three days, I mean you get kind of nuts when you get into this. You I take my own light bulbs with me. <laughs> the first thing I do is unscrew and put in the other light bulbs. Um, some of them, the 100 watts are being taken off the market, but for a price, if you see me afterwards, I, I collected a lot of them some time back because has anybody ever see an, seen an X-ray, you know, a real X-ray, the radiation itself? You know, you take a flashlight, you take this thing, and, you know, you can see the light. Can you see an X-ray? No, oh, you cannot see an X-ray. But from these light bulbs that are emitting the energy of mercury, you can't see that, but it can see your brain. In my office, we have some overheads that are supposedly mercury-free. Paid 7,000 bucks for that. I'd rather have the 7,000 bucks because I don't think they're mercury-free. I walk in and sit down, and after four or five minutes, I find myself doing this. So I think about everybody in the office now uses lamps, don't they? Did I tell them to? Huh. It's just given a choice. You migrate to an area where you're not being exposed. You're not being toxified. <clears throat> and back to salt, the salt that we recommend is almost the same thing that you find in the drugstore, in the pharmacy, what is called Morton's Pickling and Canning Salt. And I don't care. I don't own stock in Morton's. But that is a good one. Ball makes one too. But it's a pickling and canning salt has less of everything in it than anything else. But the thing that really messes people up is the non-biological form of sodium and potassium that is in um, sea salt. And those minerals are also in a non-biological form, so they are all contamination. And that's why I say that people who use the sea salt, I can't do anything for them. You get them off the sea salt, and I can get rid of that non-biological sodium and potassium and the other 55 minerals we don't need. And then we may be able to turn around some diseases. <coughs> 
and go back to a non-karyogenic diet so you don't have to worry about whether you're putting mercury or aluminum in the mouth. You know, in Price's studies, uh, he dug up in one place um, 1,000 skulls, I think it was. <clears throat> well, no, it was 1,000 something. He dug up a whole lot of them, and he found one cavity at the time of death, one cavity per 1,000 teeth. So, yes, if you're on a non-karyogenic diet, you don't have to have cavities. Cavities were not part of, as the ADA says, this is just something that naturally goes along with advanced civilizations. It goes along with our civilization, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's advanced. So respect the comment from COS, from Colorado Springs. First, do no harm. And now you know my opinion of what harm is. So it might be well to become a member of the true health profession, not one that is creating disease. And I admit <clears throat> that I have crammed a lot down your throat in a half a day. <clears throat> so go back to the past, but you can keep the Corvette. <laughs> Thank you.